Hey guys, welcome to the Tuesday live stream. I'm uh, Pastor Mike Winger. We're going to talk about anger today. Something a little different than what I normally do on Tuesdays. We do theology and apologetics. Um, today, this is a big issue. I am on red alert because how could I not be if I'm talking about anger issues? But let me tell you exactly what you can expect. Um, um, I think that uh, that a survey of different biblical passages dealing with anger, where we're sort of analyzing anger, if we can stop and have a dispassionate approach to the topic of anger, we can learn a lot and grow a lot and change a lot in our obedience to Christ in this topic. And so, um, so we're going to do that today. We're going to do the the topic of anger. Um, let me know if you guys see me there in the live stream. I have a couple quick announcements I'll make uh, as, as we're just making sure everything's running smoothly today. If you're not interested in announcements and you're watching the replay, just skip ahead like 30 seconds or a minute and you'll be good. So let's see a couple different announcements. Um, for one, I, um, I did uh, hey there, thanks, thanks Sarah for letting me know you see me there. I did a, uh, an informal debate yesterday. I'll, I think that's probably the most accurate term is informal debate yesterday slash conversation um, with uh, a guy, an atheist, uh, atheist agnostic guy named Skylar Fiction. That's his YouTube channel. Um, uh, someone in the in the comments has been you know recommending people to go watch that. So there will be a link in the in the um, in the comments that you guys can see there from Not a Theist. You can actually just click it. But also I'll try to put that link down below. But the topics is, are morality and hard Bible passages and slavery and um, and uh, uh, judgment that that involves the death of. of young ones and things like that like it's hard tough stuff and I of course I don't get to say everything I want to say and he doesn't get to say everything he wants to say because it's a back and forth debate type conversation but if you're interested in that topic um, you're welcome to check that out and I'd love to hear your guys opinions on that now um, other than that, let's see, I've got some fun stuff coming up. I'm actually this week, I'm going to be going over to Living Waters. That's, that is Ray Comfort's ministry, right? I'm going to be heading over there to record a bunch of short videos offering answers to questions. Uh, you know, answers to common or tough questions about Christianity, little short two to five minute answers. And then when I'm done, they're going to use that, those, those videos. And I'm also going to use them. So I'll be putting them up on this channel kind of periodically, maybe one a week, throwing up, uh, one of the videos that I've done there. We'll probably record over 30 videos this week. So I'm prepping for that. <laughs> so that should be really fun. Um, okay. So again, you can put your questions in the comment section at the end of the stream, which will be fairly soon. Um, AJ will send those to me and I will answer your questions. It's going to be a slightly shorter stream today than usual. I think that's the plan. So anger, anger is kind of a big deal. Anger is one of those super basic human issues. We all face it. You face it too. I'm not here talking about angry people. I'm talking about people who deal with anger, which is the entire population of the planet, right? We all deal with anger. We have anger problems. If you're one of those who tries to say, I just never even get angry at all, then um, have fun with that, right? But for the rest of us, for the rest of us who recognize that we do have this problem, um, yeah, we need to deal with it. And in my opinion, I've seen even godly leaders, godly men and women who don't deal with anger in biblical ways. And I think it undermines their witness and I think it damages their... Um, uh, their ability to represent Christ to the world. And I think it's a big, 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 big deal. So we're on red alert for that purpose right there. So the verse we're going to be in this to start in today is Colossians chapter three, verse eight. And oh my, I just realized how small the font is for you guys. Let me fix that real quick. Um, how about that? Is that a little better? <laughs> okay. So Colossians three, eight, um, it says, but now you must put them away, them all away. These are the things you have to put away or put off is another way to translate that anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. These are the things that we're told to put off, to get away from ourselves that as a Christian, I, I don't want to have this in any way, part of my life. Um, I know put it off anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk. Now in the Bible, when I see a list of things, I, I generally don't think that the author is just making sort of a pointless list where he's adding more and more words that all mean the same thing. I look at the list and I ask, how is, say in this case, anger different than malice? How is wrath different than slander? How, how, how do these things um, sort of give us a fuller picture because they're different things compared to one another? And as we do that, uh, we can apply it to our lives in some really, actually some pretty neat ways. So let's first talk about anger. 
the first one on the list, we'll spend most of our time on this and then we'll then we'll explain how the rest all tie in to the issue of anger. Anger, what, what is anger? You ever try to define anger like what is anger anyways? Um, I've sat down and tried to define it and every every definition I come up with seems a little bit lacking. And so in trying to come up with a careful and thoughtful definition of anger, the best thing I've come up with is, is that anger is that grr feeling that you get. It's anger, right? It's grr. I'm, I'm, I am, I know what anger is. I feel it. That's anger. It's, it's, it's a changed perspective or something in me that is driving, wanting to drive my life, drive my thoughts, change my actions. And in a sense, we all know what anger is, whether or not we can offer the, the best definition for it. It's that grr feeling. Um, and we have plenty of bad examples in our lives. Just look around. You you know people, maybe even wonderful, godly people, but you don't want you don't like them angry, right? They they have anger issues. Um, I've got plenty of bad examples in my life of people who don't handle anger correctly, people who just do their own thing. It doesn't matter to them what the scripture says. I once had a guy who was a pastor. Um, we were on a bit of a mission trip at the time, and a pastor that was local. He said that him and his wife would get angry and yell and say mean things to one another, and it just happened on a regular basis. And I'm not kidding, his opinion was, and it doesn't affect our marriage at all. And I remember him telling me that, like, yeah, we get, we, we get mad, we yell, we scream at each other, but it doesn't affect our marriage. That's just, that's just the way we are. It's just the way we do things. But scripture's calling us to live a specific kind of life, not necessarily a life that follows after the pattern of our family before us, but the life that follows after the pattern of our Christ who went before us, right? We're called to live a very specific kind of godliness that is a higher standard than the world most likely is going to acknowledge, but they'll appreciate it if we live it. Um, and so, yes, anger, putting off anger. So let's, let's look at some scriptures specifically talking about the topic of anger. We're going to go to Proverbs, Proverbs, the book of wisdom. Um, man, I love Proverbs. First book of the Bible I ever actually started to read was the book of Proverbs. When I first got saved, I was about uh, 12 years old. <laughs> um, and I, I picked up Proverbs and started reading it and uh, changed my life. So Proverbs 15.1, it says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So we, we learn here that, that when somebody's upset, um, a soft answer can cause their wrath to be turned away from, from you because you're offering a soft answer, but a harsh word, you responding in anger to their anger, that that will actually stir up more anger in them. And one example of this that I can think of from my life was, um, was when I was uh, driving down the street, my first car was a, a 1966 Mustang and uh, it, it wasn't as cool as you might, as it sounds. It was just, it was, it was barely holding together and I didn't have any money. So I couldn't like afford the repairs that it needed. One of the problems was at one point it had an electrical issue with the brake lights. The brake lights were out. Um, I think it just ended up being a fuse, but I didn't know that at that age. Um, but anyway, the, the brake lights were out and I wasn't able to get that fixed at the time right away. And this guy noticed driving behind me and he, and he, and he pulls up alongside me. I was on my way home from school. This is in high school. I'm on my way home from school and he pulls up alongside me and the guy's just cussing at me and yelling at me, you blankety blank blank, you know, and he says, you're blanking brake lights are out, you blanking blanky head, you know, <laughs> except he didn't use the word blank. But I remember that moment, my gut reaction being a human, maybe partly being a guy, I don't know, my gut reaction was, was to want to say something rude to him back, right? A harsh word that might perhaps stir up more anger from him, but I was... I was following the Lord and I, I really thought that to honor God, I would respond differently. So in a, in a moment, in a moment's reflection, I turned to the guy and I said, I'm really sorry about that, sir. I'm going to get it fixed as soon as I can. And I, I said, sir, in a respectful way, not an insulting kind of sarcastic way. And what was crazy was his next, the next moment he turns to me and goes, oh, no problem, buddy. Have a great day. And then he just drives off into the sunset, you know, and, um, and I, and as I turned the corner heading back towards home, I just remember thinking, Proverbs 15, 1, right? A soft answer turns away wrath. That there's this, there's this kindness that can like stop the process that gets us into battles and fights with one another, that gets us into hard, difficult moments where you just give, you know what? Maybe they deserve it. Maybe they don't. I'm just going to give a soft answer. And I think that Proverbs 15, 1 works on you with yourself. When you're getting angry and you have that inner monologue or you perhaps you're just talking to yourself, right? And you're alone and you're having an argument with someone that's not even there and you're using harsh words and the harsh words are making you more angry 
What if you stopped and you used soft words? And even in your own, your monologue, right? When no one's around and you're thinking about that person, instead you go, maybe they have a reason why they did that. Maybe they don't really understand where I'm coming from on that issue. And then all of a sudden your wrath turns away. And that to me is great wisdom from the book of Proverbs. Uh, a soft answer turns away wrath, not only for you, but for others. And the harsh word, whether you it's directed to someone else or at yourself, it can all, it can radically stir things up. The next verse is Proverbs 15, 18. Proverbs 15, 18 says, a hot tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. A, uh, a hot tempered man. Are you like that? Are you, are you a hot tempered man? Um, if you're hot tempered and you think, well, I'm, well, of course I am. I'm a redhead or something like that. Like if you're just hot tempered and you think that's just part of who you are in your DNA, um, the Bible's actually telling you that's part of your sin nature, not part of your good nature, right? This is, this is a bad thing. And I just, I mean, you know, since I'm here really far away from you, uh, you know, standing in front of a computer, uh, webcam, I, I feel at liberty to tell you that you have a sin issue that's going on. Whereas if I was in your presence, I might just, uh, run away. Uh, but if, you have, if you're the hot-tempered person, you stir up strife. Do you wonder why your friendships always end up in fights? Like, do you wonder why you, you can't hold together long-term relationships? Um, why, why is it that when I bring up a list of names of people you've known closely in the past, you have broken bridges between you and them one after another? Well, that's because, catch this, you stir up strife with your hot temper. On the other side, it's he who's slow to anger quiets contention. That is to say that if if you can just slow down, you can quiet the contention. You can stop this division. The contention means the battle between two people. You just all you have to do, right, is slow down. Slow down. Because the first thing I want to do when I'm angry is I want to speed up and react quickly. React harshly to the situation. Instead, slow down. That's the uh, counsel of scripture on that. Slow it down. Don't cause division. Don't cause unnecessary burnt bridges between you and everybody else. And it will add up. It'll stack up as, as we get older in life. I thought it was, I thought it was just my friends. Then I realized, no, it's my coworkers too. And now it's my family and my friends and my coworkers and everybody's always so mean to me. And sometimes, sometimes I'm just not admitting the truth that I've got something that I'm doing that's triggering a lot of this stuff. Um, it's hard, hard lessons to learn, but important stuff. Proverbs 16, 32 it says, whoever's slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. I love this verse. Slow to anger. Notice that the Bible doesn't say you won't even get angry. Like, I don't know what kind of monk you, 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 you might expect to become as you become, as you follow Christ. Like, oh, I never get angry at all. Of course not. Uh, actually, the Bible anticipates you're going to get angry. This will happen. The, the counsel is how to handle it when you get angry. That's the counsel. So it's not even expected you'll never get angry. Rather, here it says, be slow to anger. At least slow it down. Slow down how quickly you give yourself permission to be mad. You, you feel that, that right, that sense of, I have a right to be angry. I'm, uh, just, I'm right to feel this way. Just slow it down. Just slow it down. And this verse, though, it says something so much, so much more than that. It says the person who does slow it down, they're slow to anger, they're better than the mighty. Well, who's the mighty? Well, you know, the second part talks about him who takes a city. The, the idea here is a celebrity, someone who's well-known for actual accomplishments, as opposed to being well-known for being well-known, which is modern, modern celeb status, right? You're well-known because you're a celeb. That doesn't, that just, it's like circular reasoning, but yes, that's what happens. But, but they're saying, you know, like you've done some really magnificent thing. Like you've really accomplished something wonderful. You know, what's better than that is a guy who can just control his own spirit. That's it. Just a guy who has self-control is better than the mighty. Now, it may not be a big deal to you, but your self-control in the area of anger, according to scripture, is more important than, than your status at work, how high you've risen in society, um, how many accomplishments you can, you can look into your past and see, how much stuff you can put on your resume. Like This stuff's all secondary to your character, and your character's uh, better than all that stuff. And, and truth be told, right? Like, whether it's friends or loved ones, you'd rather have a friend who's kind than one who's, who's you know, mighty or well-known or anything like that. Like, I'd rather just have friends that are just good friends. And, um, yeah, so your inner character it matters tremendously. It's a really big deal, and it may not be a big deal to, to you. My encouragement, if that's you, maybe it's not you, but if it's you and you're out there going, 
you know, I have, I have anger, so what? I don't care. It's not a big deal. Well, the Bible says it is. Um, Proverbs 19.11, it says, Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Now, this like flips the tables upside down uh, on the topic of anger because we think, um, you know, someone hurts you, somebody wounds you, and we think it's shameful if I don't do something to get them, to get back at them, right? Like if I don't say something to, they chopped at me, I'm going to chop at them. Or I feel embarrassed. I feel shame because I didn't attack them back. And the Bible flips that upside down. It says it's actually glorious if you just overlook, overlook an offense. They offended you and you overlooked it. That's glorious. And isn't that, I mean, God's, of course, method with us, with with uh, with Christ. I mean, he's not only is he paying for our sins, but in our times of rebellion, he's overlooking so much, so frequently, and he calls us to emulate the same thing. It's glory to overlook. It's not shame. You feel embarrassed, but that's just the sin nature. Um, what you should feel is this is my chance to represent Christ. I've been wounded, I've been hurt, they gossiped about me, they talked bad about me, they made fun of me, they lied about me. Um, I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be gracious. I'm going to get over it. I'm going to put it off and I'm going to move forward. And that is glorious. Uh, wow, that's that's good. That's good stuff. So Proverbs uh, 27.4, another scripture for you. Um, Wrath is cruel. Anger is overwhelming. But who can stand before jealousy? The point of Proverbs 27.4 is not to suggest that wrath is good or bad here. That it, That's not the point in this verse. Or that, or that anger here is good or bad. It's just saying how intense they are. And the thing I want us to recognize here is that when I'm angry, I become intense. And I overreact, right? Like, I don't shut a door. I slam a door, right? I don't say something. I say something harsh. I don't just do what needs to be done. I go overboard with it. That's the nature of anger, is that it, it turns me into a caricature of myself and an ugly one at that. I overreact. That's my tendency. Um, in in my, uh, my time of doing counseling, I've realized um, that a lot of people don't, um, don't realize they have an angry face. Uh, that is, <clears throat> there's, there's a point at which they, they, the, the, the switch flips and they get mad and they reveal that angry person that is, that they're capable of being. Now, usually if you've known someone for many years, you probably have seen their angry face. You know what I'm talking about? Angry face. And you, and you know what they're like when they're like that. They're cruel, right? Anger is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. It's, it's, it is not a good thing. And that's this, the, the lesson I think from Proverbs 27, four, this, this is intense. Anger is an intense thing. And it's it's when your sin nature comes to the front and oftentimes is controlling you. Anger itself is not necessarily sinful, but it leads us into sin very reliably, which is really pretty dangerous. Your your anger is very dangerous. It's actually extremely dangerous. Let me look at another scripture in Ephesians. Ephesians 4.26. While I'm going there, I'll, I'll mention um, one of my goals as a husband is um, uh, to make sure that my wife never sees my angry face. So we're, you know, I, I, and I don't, I don't think she has, I don't think she's, we've been married for almost, you know, we're going on 10 years coming up here. I don't think she has, not to, not to my knowledge. Um, not like she's never seen me irritated or even frustrated. Um, but you know what I mean by angry face, right? Like that man who is not yielding to the control of the Holy Spirit, but is now being that guy. And, um, and now plenty of people saw my angry face growing up. I was, I was, I was like, you know, that I was triggered. I would get triggered <laughs> growing up very much. So, um, yeah, that's for sure the case. And, um, ask my sister, <laughs> she'll tell you. And, um, and, and I was, it was just a slow growing process in Christ. I'm not naturally this, a peaceful guy. I'm supernaturally a peaceful guy as I yield my life to Christ. Um, now, Ephesians 4.26, it says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now, this, this verse is often, I think, misused. So let me, let me just confront how I think there's a misuse of this verse. I, usually you hear it in marriage counseling settings, and they're telling a married couple, don't go to bed without reconciling. If you and your wife have an argument, you and your husband have an argument, don't go to bed until you've fixed the problem. Now, that might be good advice. That might actually be bad advice, to be honest. 
Um, sometimes it's better to agree to love one another, leave it unreconciled, the problem unfixed, but your relationship reconciled. So you can, you can have a re solid relationship without fixing the problem um, because you just need some time to like process things, you know, and to kind of bring your, bring your hearts around and pray about it and that sort of thing. But, but this, it doesn't say you can't go to bed until you and your wife agree, like, or you and your husband agree. That's not what it says. Thank God. Like it says, don't go to, don't let the sun go down on your anger, yours, not theirs, yours. So my goal is to not allow anger to be harbored in my heart. It's going to come up, but I can't let it stay in me. I need to not let it go down, let the sun go down or not have a prolonged season of anger. That's a very dangerous thing as a Christian, as a, as a person, really. <clears throat> because verse 27, it gives opportunity to the devil. Satan's going to use this. Anger is going to become the temptation. It's going to, become, <clears throat> going to become the thing that ends up leading me into sin. We can actually read in scripture a passage that talks about this in Genesis chapter 4. You know the passage. <coughs> Pardon me. The Lord said to Cain, this was right before Cain killed his brother, right? And God talks to Cain. And says, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? His face had not physically fallen off. That would be a misunderstanding. This is a, a euphemism for his, he was, he was, instead of this, he's this. Face fallen. You know, it's down there in that angry face. His angry face is going. Um, if you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. So he's actually <clears throat> got this internal battle going on and the, the battle takes place not only when he picks up a stone and slays his brother, but way ahead of time when he's just ruminating on it, meditating on it, thinking about how mad he is and he's letting that anger fester in his heart and then it leads to horrible sin. In fact, that's the very next thing that happens in the passage. You will have an internal battle in your life dealing with anger guaranteed, guaranteed. And if you don't think you have that battle, I think you're probably just unaware of it. And all you have to do is ask other people. Well, they may not even tell you because let's be honest, if you tend towards anger and you ask people about it, they're going to just nod their heads and smile and try to avoid your anger instead of giving you the honest answer. Most of them. Um, <clears throat> but yes, it's a big deal. It becomes the avenue through which sin enters my life and controls me pretty big stuff. This is basic Christianity, um, but at the same time, how often do, do people practice it? That's the question. How, in fact, forget people. I'm not here trying to judge the church. I need to apply this to my life. You've got to apply this to yours. Let's just make it about me, right? Make it about you. Proverbs 29, 22. It says, a man of wrath stirs up strife and one given to anger causes much transgression. Just to say like a person who's given to anger, that concept given to anger, it means that they're just, they're, they find it more easy to slide into anger than they do into something like say gratitude or joy or happiness. Now, maybe that's you. Maybe you're like, Mike, that's just the way I am. Okay. I just, I, I'm like permanent poopy face. That's just the kind of person I am. And the, the, that just means that this will be a battle for you. That's what that means. You have to not be okay with it. You don't have to pretend to be happy when you're not. I'm not suggesting that. But rather to say, I don't want to simply go, because I'm naturally drawn towards this, that makes it okay or that makes it good. Instead, I have to go, okay, I have to be careful. Because if I get frustrated and angry a lot, it's going to draw me towards sin. It's going to cause transgression. Um, that, that's the thing. If I'm drawn to anger, I'm drawn to transgression. I'm drawn to sin. It's again, anger is dangerous to you, not just to your family or friends, not just to your kids and your loved ones, but it's also dangerous to you because it, it draws you towards sin. The thing about anger is it's, it's like, it's an internal battle, right? It, a lot of the other stuff is on the outside, but this is, this is an internal issue. Proverbs 25, 28, it says a man Without self-control is like a city into uh, a city broken into and left without walls. Now, in that culture and time, a city that has no walls is a city with no defense. That is to say, anybody can raid and ruin that city. And the idea is here, if you follow whatever gut reaction you've got about anger, if that's my thing, if I follow my, you know, you're going to get the gut reaction. I do, you will, we all do. But if you follow it, if you're not slow, if you don't calm down, if you don't use soft words now, but instead you go down the, the, the path of harshness and wrath, 
if you do that, then you are the one with no self-control, which is like a city with no walls. And the, what is it that's breaking into the city? It's anger. Coming and raiding and messing up your life and damaging. Do you guys know statistically, it's an interesting statistic I heard, that <clears throat> the number one reason people lose their jobs is not poor job performance. The number one reason is bad attitudes responding in anger to their employers or to customers. That is the number one reason people lose their jobs. See, they're, they're like a city broken into left without walls. They would have kept their job if they just kept their attitudes right, you know? And that's, um, it's just to say this is a real human problem and we really want to honor Christ, so we really want to change the way we deal with it. Um, now this means... If anger is a real problem, and it's a problem that I have to deal with on a personal level, it means that it's, this is not just about appearances. If you're like, I'm just going to make sure that I don't look angry. But, but that's not the Christian goal, right? Looking angry, looking, or looking not angry, that's not the Christian goal. It's rather actually dealing with the internal battle so that I'm not a man who's controlled by anger and by my urges for, that are irritated and frustrated with people, that kind of thing. Let me share with you another scripture because pulling all these verses together, I think, I think is really helpful. Romans 12, <clears throat> starting in verse 17 here. It says, repay no one evil for evil. Think about that. Repay no one evil for evil. Someone does evil to you. They hurt you. Immediate reaction, obviously, to pay them back, to do something to them. They cut me off. I want to cut them off. I want to honk at them extra long. You know, I want, to, I, want to, I want to express how I feel so they can feel it too. I want to give them evil for evil, right? But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. The thing that helps me to stop responding in kind and, you know, out of anger is when I realize that God is watching. Others are watching me and my witness of Christ. And that this is not just about me and that person. This is about my ex, my uh, my imaging of God. Some people would say my my representation of Christ to all of these things, to all of those people, and before the Lord Himself. So <clears throat> think about it. Think about what's honorable in the sight of all people. What is honorable, rather than getting back, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. This, verse 18 and 19, the idea here is, God says, yeah, no, if there is wrath that needs to be doled out, I will deal it out. God will deal it out, and he'll do it properly. You won't. You'll mess it up. Your sin will get in there and muck things up. You'll do it wrong. You'll misrepresent Christ. God will do perfectly what is right and just when, when his wrath comes. So you just honor him. With, by being kind. Um, verse 20 he says, To the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Um, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The burning coals concept, some people think that verse actually is talking about um, you're helping the person. That burning coals is like you're all in a campsite and their fire went out and they come and they have a bowl on their head and you put some fire coals on and they carry it to their place in the campsite. I'm inclined to think it's not that. I'm inclined to think that God is telling you, you're going to be overwhelmingly kind and you're going to be thinking, but yet God, if they're all, if they still remain unrepentant and if they're still worthy of your wrath and he says, ah, don't worry, I will take care of that. In the meantime, your kindness will hopefully lead them to repentance. They'll hopefully come to Christ. But if if that sort of thing never happens, God's going to deal with them. So in a sense, when you're crying out for justice, God's like, yes, I still want you to be kind. I'm to represent, you know, Christ to do good. This means something. This means that in that intense moment, like when I'm angry, when I'm mad, when I want my way, I'm not allowed to satisfy my desires. Because that's... When you're angry, that grr, I'm looking to satisfy the grr, right? With with something. Something in me is going to come out to satisfy my grr feelings. And that's what I don't get to do. Do you wonder why Jesus called it dying to yourself? <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's the call. That's the call. Christian brother or sister, die to yourself. Your anger is never an excuse to sin. I don't even, I don't even in my vocabulary, I don't even say things like, you made me mad. Because now I'm blaming them for how what, what's going on with me right now. I, I just I try to avoid that. I think it's honoring to the Lord to do that. So you you have to you don't get to satisfy your irritations at all in any way, shape, or form. And 
then we get to the next thing there. And let's, let's look at our, our primary passage, right? Colossians 3, 8, <clears throat> you must put off or put, a, put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice. Let's look at wrath. What's wrath? Well, anger, I think is that grr feeling. Wrath, I think here is talking about the outburst of anger. So anger is the feeling in me, grr. I want to satisfy that. Wrath is when I let it out somehow. I let anger control my body. I let it control my tongue. I slam the door. I raise my voice. They're not, they're not far away. They can hear me just fine, but I sure am getting loud. You know, I yell at them or I do worse things. I'm actually physically violent. You're breaking your gaming remotes. You're smashing things. You're rage quitting. Um, you name it, you name it. That's wrath. That is all wrath, that that sort of thing. Wrath is, I think, the expression of anger outwardly. Uh, James uh, one nineteen, which I am unable to properly type. Um, it says, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. See, here's the. this is the problem with that wrath. When I let my wrath out, when I let anger out, I'm not doing what's right. I, I just, I do it wrong. Okay, you're not so holy that your anger is pure and that your anger comes out in right ways so that you are like rightly distributing your anger upon the world. Rather, God does that. He's, wrath is rightfully his. You do it wrong. You do it wrong. This means that when you when you get angry um, and you're, you're just, you've got to let it out. You feel like you've got to let it out so you get loud, so you get violent so you get extreme you get intense the statement here from scripture that i get is instead slow to speak right when i when i'm intensely upset and i want to talk faster now and louder now the opposite is what i'm called to do slow down stop talking be quiet when in let's say marriage for an example when in marriage i so intensely have something i want to say to my wife to just get at her right that's exactly when i should say nothing nothing slow to speak in fact i should stop and i should be listening when i'm getting upset i should do what i can to calm myself down and not to let it out in some way when you let it out you give it control you cause harm you cause division you, you can't take it back so that's wrath anger is the grr feeling wrath is the letting it out and if you honestly think about it what in your life are you do you do that's wrathful do you pound things do you hit things well maybe i just hit a pillow i i just scream with my face in the pillow that's wrath. But I'm not hurting anybody. You're right. You're not hurting anybody except you because you're letting wrath control you. And you're called to be a child of God and a follower of Christ. You're called to put off, to just put it off, to die to it, not to let it out, not to let it control you, not to redirect it, to die to it. That's a high calling, but it's our calling. We've got another, uh, another concept here in, in uh, Colossians 3.8. And that is, put off anger, wrath, malice. Malice is interesting. Malice is interesting because it's the it's kind of the opposite of wrath. Um, so anger is that girl feeling. Wrath is letting it out. I let it control my, my words. I let it control my body. I let it control my face. You know, I let it control me. Um, malice is when I bottle it up. You see, you may you may hear this whole time be thinking that I'm, I'm suggesting that you bottle up your anger. Actually, bottling it up is also a problem. In fact, it's... it's potentially a huge, huge problem. Old anger is, is creates bitterness. Um, and, and you know, you feel this way towards somebody when, when you can't view them the way you view everyone else, right? Everything they say, you view, you view differently. If they say something nice, you, you can't quite take it the same way. If they do something good, you, you can't quite be happy about what they did. There's like a skewed, um, twisted view of that person. And that is not because of them. That is because of the malice that is inside of my own heart. Uh, someone described malice as evil intent. I, I think it's, it's a, it's an evil way of viewing that person. I, I see them through the lens of my old bitter anger. Someone mentions their name and you feel like, oh, pff, them, you know, and you can't help but Maybe say something negative about them. Roll your eyes. Resist approving of something that they've done. Um, that would be malice. Malice. Some see God this way. Um, I, I see this when we deal with the skeptical community. Not everybody. Not every skeptic at all. Please don't think I mean that. But there are some individuals who are part of the, um, the kind of anti-Bible group that... You know, when they even read a Bible passage, I, I think this was ex exampled in my discussion with Skylar the other day, 
when they, you know, I'm not saying he experiences this. I don't know what goes on in his heart, but, but I do wonder when I hear these types of things, if, if there's a reason why they can't read the scripture for what it says and they have to project onto it, these negative intentions and negative views that when you just analyze it very kind of dispassionately, like you just don't see that there. That's just not what it said. And, and that, that kind of happens over and over again. Which is why a Christian and non-Christian, in some cases, can read the same passage. And one guy goes, hey, look, I see God uh, providing you know, protections and human rights for people. And someone else goes, I see God supporting oppression. And maybe, maybe malice is, is part of the reason for that. Um, or just confusion. Maybe there's other reasons as well. Um, but we, some people, you, you see a, a spouse this way. You, you can't hardly approve of anything they say. Anybody mentions your spouse, you got to say something negative about them. And that's just malice. Like you don't think you have anger problems. You're, you're living in it. You're living in it. That's malice. Maybe it's a parent, a step parent, a sibling, someone you work with. What do you do if you feel this way? Do you, if you feel this way, I'm not leaving you alone, okay? You're not without hope. Look, here's what you do. You feel malice. Here's what you do. Jesus said, you've heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And by persecute, he didn't just make, make fun of. It was, he means actually persecute so that you may be sons of your father who's in heaven for he makes his son rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Here's a, by the way, here's another verse that's always misunderstood. Um, the sun rising and the rain falling are both positive things. The rain is not trials. The rain here is rain to grow your crops. Like, in other words, God pours out blessings upon all people. Can you just do the same thing? Um, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. If you feel malice towards somebody, every, every, here's my counsel is every time you feel that towards that person, stop and pray for them. But Mike, you don't understand they're evil. That, guess what? They need your prayers. Pray, prayers that they would come to repentance, prayers that they would come to salvation, prayers that they would have their lives transformed. But, they, but stop and pray for them every time you feel that Gah! or that twisted view of them where you, you know, like, I shouldn't see them this way, Lord. Every time pray for them. Uh, why do I say that? Because that's what I've uh, done in my life. And it has, it has had real benefit when I feel, you know, I feel like, Ooh, there's something in my heart toward them that I don't want in my heart, uh, towards anyone, you know, and, and I just pray, um, every time pray for them, God bless them, God help them. Don't pray about them, praying about people, you know, Lord, or deal with them. God, that's not praying for people. <laughs> that's just praying about them. Very different kind of thing. Um, but then it goes on. We're almost done here. Colossians 3, 8. And then I'll, I'll take some of your guys' questions and we'll do a probably slightly shorter uh, stream today, like I said. Uh, but now you must put, put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. The last two on this list, slander and obscene talk. Uh, uh, New King James translates slander as blasphemy because in the Greek, it's, it's the Greek word for blasphemy. Uh, but the word could be used referencing God or referencing people. I think in this case, the ESV has got the better translation. And not that I'm a Greek scholar, like I'm just saying based upon what I've looked into. Um, and, and you can see it in the English. The context, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk, these are all things you're having towards people, generally speaking. So the slander is towards individuals. How does it fit with anger, the inner ger, wrath, the outward expression of it, malice, the bottling up of bitter feelings towards people? Slander is what you do when you are mad, right? This is, this is what comes out. I don't even want to speak a word in anger based on what I see in scripture here. I don't even want to say a word in anger. This is why the constant counsel is slow to speak, slow to speak from Proverbs down to James, slow down, slow down. You're upset. You're angry. You want to talk. That's the exact opposite of what you should do now. Slow down. Slander is when I attack a person's character, when I come against them, uh, when I want to say something negative about them. That's the idea. Slander. And then finally, filthy language or obscene talk, it says there in, in the verse. And obscene talk, of course, is, is what? Cursing, um, saying, just, it's, it's meant to be an, a catch-all, right? It's not just about filthy language in the sense of cuss words. It's about the kinds of things people say because they're angry. Colossians 3.8. 
includes like everything you do when you're mad and says don't do it anger wrath malice don't you know what you feel an angry you got to put it off you got you can't bottle it up nope that's malice you can't let it out nope that's wrath you can't let it control your tongue that'd be slander oh i won't direct it at people i'll just be yelling and mad oh that's obscene uh talk from your mouth all of it all of it all of it just put it all off die to yourself don't don't satisfy it in any way shape or form don't let it control you my counsel to you is this. Now, some of you guys, you, you, a lot of you follow me because you're like, Mike, I, I like the, the theology. I like the Bible studies, right? Others are going, I like the apologetics or the defense of the Christian faith. Yet what I find is that th this is the kind of issue we generally don't think about, but is sometimes way more important than coming up with a better answer to an objection or a better explanation of a, of a theological concept, right? This is like you following Jesus with your character, You've been called as a Christian. You have been called. And if you're non-Christian, guess what? This is, this is what God wants from us. Uh, the, the one counsel I give to you if you don't know Christ is you give your life to Christ. You have the Holy Spirit to help you with this. That you're not on your own. Um, it is the transformation that comes as God works in your life. And it's a beautiful and wonderful thing. It is so liberating. It is so freeing when you realize that it's not all about you being a victim of everything that happens in life. Rather, you see life and it's hardships and challenges as like this opportunity to serve Christ no matter what's going on, no matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it's been, this is your chance to serve Christ. Put off anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Just put it all off. And if, and if you want more, just keep reading in Colossians. It's got some pretty awesome, awesome stuff in there. So, um, Good timing, AJ. Thanks. You just sent me the questions. I'm going to take your guys' questions now. And uh, again, I don't, you know, they can be about whatever you like today. I realize this is a little different from, than my normal Tuesday thing. It's something I wanted to talk about. I'm hoping next uh, Tuesday I'm going to deal with an issue related to the evidence for the resurrection of Christ. I kind of want to take that topic and break it into a bunch of individual issues and then have video content teaching people about them to train and help them to defend the resurrection. Um, so that, that hopefully I'll, I'll do one of those, uh, next Tuesday. If that's, if though, actually I'm thinking about it and, um, it would not be my normal time. If I do a live stream next Tuesday, it will not be at 5 PM Pacific standard time, which is my normal time because I have a, a wedding rehearsal. I'm, I'm doing a wedding coming up uh, next week. So um, I don't know for sure if I'll be able to do one or what time there's that announcement. Okay. Question number one from nebulized mackerel juice. I won't even ask you to explain that name. Um, how do we control anger against someone who is still consistently hurting us? Um, <clears throat> well, notice that uh, that the deal with controlling your anger, it it has nothing to do with, say, um, self-defense. If, if someone's trying to kill me, I'm just not going to self-defense because I'm angry. I'm not going to let it be this. This is instead a wise decision I'm making to honor God with preserving life. But it's not about anger, right? If someone's consistently hurting me, I may even break up a relationship with that person and separate myself from them. I'm just not going to let anger be the thing that fuels me. I'm going to let wisdom and, and godliness be the thing that directs me instead of anger. So I would say here, what you're doing is you're doing the heart surgery to get rid of anger as your motive and anger as your filter and anger as the driving force. And you're letting other things guide you. Honoring Christ, biblical principles, uh, simple wisdom in life, um, so that, that would be my counsel there. Um, dealing with your anger doesn't mean you you don't respond um, in in any way at all to the things that are happening around you. You're just not responding out of anger. Um, <clears throat> Mariano uh, Rogers or Mariano Mariano I don't know uh, says I'm angry at my uh, grandmother for something she recently just did. I'm choosing to never speak to her again and for the rest of her life. Am I in the wrong for that? Um, Probably. I mean, you probably are. You're, uh, I, I don't really know the situation. Um, obviously, she could have done something crazy intense that uh, may, may be way bigger than what I would assume when I, hear, when I just read she did something recently. But let me just put it this way to you. Um, what if God treated you the way that you were treating her? Um, you know, I'm really angry at you. Uh, Mariano, you, you did that and I never speaking to you again <laughs> for the rest, for the rest of eternity, you know, um, that would probably break your heart. Um, I think that you need to deal with your anger and then when you've dealt with that, you might be able to find a good way to uh, respond to her in, a, in an appropriate fashion. 
Um, Jarrett Vick says, what's your opinion of Martin Luther? How could a Christian be so hateful towards Jews? Uh, recently, we just had the, uh, the, the, the um, 501st anniversary of the Reformation. And what was interesting was I posted something on Facebook about the Reformation and it turned into um, a, at least in the comments, some people tried to turn it into a discussion about Martin Luther. And to me, Martin Luther and the Reformation are not the same thing. Like, like if, just think about it, right? If the, if the Reformation was just Martin Luther, it wouldn't be a Reformation. It'd be one dude, right? There was a, a movement. There was a whole lot going on, a lot more than the few names that you know from that time period. Um, <clears throat> anyhow, um, what's my opinion of him? Um, Martin Luther was super, super intense. Some people say Martin Luther was a, a theologian of the heart. Um, uh, my, the first commentary, one of the first commentaries I ever read was Martin Luther's. I taught through Galatians when I was like 19 and I didn't have any money and I couldn't, I didn't have any commentaries or, or, or any of the books that you see behind me. Um, and so online, uh, on, on, on something called the internet, uh, they had, they had this, this old book written by Martin Luther, his commentary of Galatians translated into English. Actually, I, I read through that, that actually, uh, um, it was really interesting reading something from so long ago. Someone's commenting on a, on a book of the Bible that I'm reading right now, you know, so very interesting. Um, I think Martin Luther understood correctly uh, several things. I think that I disagree with him on other points. Um, I'm really glad that he wrote the 95 Theses and nailed them onto the church door. I'm glad that he got that conversation started um, in a more official capacity. Um, I, but I, I look at him as a, as a normal human. Uh, some people think that uh, that Protestants, as non non Catholics, that we would we would uh, reject the Pope and replace him with Martin Luther. But that's to misunderstand what it means to not be Catholic, right? There's we reject not just the Pope, like it's some personal thing against him as a person. We reject the papacy as a whole. That is not a biblical concept. It's not in the scriptures. We reject it entirely. So we, we still have, you know, church authorities and things like that locally, but nothing like a papacy. So for Martin Luther, uh, earlier on, he was reaching out to, um, uh, to Jews. He thought that they would per perhaps come to Christ and he'd have a ministry to them. There was a lot of weird stuff that happened between him and Jewish people. Maybe even, I, I you know, I don't want to speculate because I don't know the whole story. He later changed his mind and he wrote some 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 horrible things uh, about Jewish people. And for that, I would say that they're horrible. Those are horrible things. I have no reason to support what he wrote there. And I don't. And anyway, that's my view of Martin Luther. <laughs> so so he's a complicated person. I'm glad for some of the stuff he did. And, uh, I think some of the stuff he later wrote was horrible. Uh, but I, don't, I also don't think that that anti-Semitism characterizes him as a whole. But I utterly reject it. And as, as any part of him that was that is something I reject. Uh, number four, uh, from uh, Meta Skipper says, is forgive and forget biblical. After we forgive, how do we regard or not regard past offensives? I think the phrase forgive and forget is a little clumsy when it comes to real life. In my opinion. Um, I once heard a pastor uh, read from, I think it was Isaiah, that God, uh, he forgets our iniquities. He remembers them no more. And they didn't understand perhaps that this is a statement where God will not bring them to remembrance or he won't put them in front of your face again. It's like, I've dealt with it. It happened, but it's in the past, like water under a bridge concept. He literally taught the people that because the Bible says so, they have to actually forget as in not remember what the person did to them in the past. And I remember hearing that going, that's not what that means. Like that's reading it, you know, in in a hyper literal sense, like not even what the author intended it to mean. It's just a misunderstanding, you know. It'd be like saying that David, when he says, uh, I make my bed swim with tears, as if he literally meant his bed was swimming through his room in a pool of tears. Like that's, he's obviously not meaning that. Um, so for forgive and forget, I look at it this way. I'm called to forgive as Christ forgave. And so I do, I try to copy the way Jesus does it. Jesus, he pays the price. It's already paid. He deals with the issues on his side. His arms are wide open on the cross. He's like, I will receive you. I will accept you. But there is a condition and you have to come in, in, in an attitude of repentance and change. So on my part, forgiveness is already given, but our relationship will not be restored until that person's ready to change. Now it depends on the offense, right? If the offense is, oh, they, 
they hurt my feelings one day. I don't not going to break the relationship. But if the person like say is this abusive family member and you've forgiven them because of Christ, but that doesn't mean you have to be restored in relationship with that person. You can forgive them and then you can say, Hey, and if they change, we can have a relationship. So I consider forgiveness like something that happens on my part, but the restoration of relationship is a different issue that requires oftentimes a change in the other person before it can happen. Um, I hope that, uh, I hope that clear, clears it up. And, uh, let's see. Um, Sarah, uh, Bochamp says, uh, hi, Pastor Mike. Hi, Sarah. Uh, can you please give me more examples of ways we can use Proverbs 15.1 on ourselves or inner self-talk when we're getting angry? I love that concept. Thanks so much. Um, so that was the, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up dissension. I'm probably quoting New King James because that's in my brain. Um, I think that the way that we can do this is by by just going straight to Jesus and going, you know, first first thought is, God, thank you for the grace you've given me. Thank you for the kindness you've given me. Um, help me to see this situation the way you see it. Um, and I, I do it in prayer. I frequently do it in prayer. Because one of the things that so quickly changes my perspective is just talking to God. Just immediately upon addressing the Lord, my attitude changes. Because it's not because if it's just me talking to myself, it's like I've got no accountability for the truthfulness of what I'm saying. So I, I recommend you use the soft answer. Use it in prayer to God. Um, talk about, uh, in your prayer, talk about the need for... Um, grace in your life and how you want to represent Christ and honor him in that with that person. Um, and yeah, that would be a couple, a couple ideas for you. Tiffany Wilson says, what if you're angry a lot at yourself? Um, that's a really complicated issue, Tiffany. I think that, um, I'll, I'll speak personally. Okay. I, I don't want to say for you, but for me, when I'm angry at me, um, I'm usually actually, I'll be honest. I'm actually upset as though I'm the victim of what I'm doing. And I'm sort of blaming. I'm like, it's like I'm doing this kind of schizophrenic type thing where I'm blaming my this other me as if that other me is causing the problems that I'm now suffering. So I find that, at least in my life, if my anger is directed at me, it's often this sort of weird way of avoiding responsibility for my own actions. So I'm not saying that's you. Please don't take me wrong here. I'm just saying that in my own internal psychology, if I feel angry at me, I'm often avoiding dealing with my own, uh, basically repenting of something that I've got wrong. And, uh, and I, and I want to be a victim of my own actions instead of accountable for them. Um, so that, that would be my, <clears throat> my thought on that. Uh, anger, anger at yourself is, um, is, is a challenging, uh, and complicated thing. Uh, the big danger there also might be that it leads you into kind of like a, a narcissistic worldview where you're just sort of, I'm just so absorbed in me and myself that I can't really see things clearly. And that'd be my, my other concern there. Um, Vincent Edwards says, hi, Mike, I, I sent you an email on Bible Thinker site. Would you consider answering that? Uh, and is it okay to be angry with bad theology? Um, yeah, I think that Ephesians says in your anger, do not sin, right? So I can be angry about it, but then you need to deal with that and you need to come out of that place and not let it lead you into sin. That's the thing. That's the thing. So it's like, it's a, see that as a process. I respond, that made me mad. Okay, Lord, I'm angry. Let me not sin in this and then move forward. Um, as far as the email goes, um, I've, I like have flagged uh, many emails for the past few days that I'm hoping to get back to. So I'm definitely going to try and do that. I'm sorry if I, if I haven't been able to, it's not because I don't care. Um, let's see. Uh, from, uh, Rocking all that time 99. Um, what if the malice is towards God to specify? How do you deal with it since you can't really pray for God like your enemies? I think that if, if you have malice towards God, I think the thing to recognize is that um, you're wrong. Is that you're So in this sense, like I'm praying for my enemies. Um, it, this is me being in a gracious position to my enemies. But but with God, if, I'm, if you're angry or mal, you know have malice in your heart towards God... God hasn't actually done anything wrong. You feel that way for sure. Obviously you feel that way, but there's something you've got wrong, right? Like Job started to feel this way in the book of Job. At the end of the book, God's like, all right, I'm going to confront you and talk to you. And Job, after all the stuff he said earlier on, he finally says, who am I? I spoke words without knowledge. I spoke out of my pain, out of my suffering. And those are real things, a visceral pain he felt. 
And he says, but I spoke words without knowledge. I didn't understand. There's things I didn't get. So at least maybe a faith position, a, a position of trusting in God's goodness, you go, I don't understand how this could be happening, God, but obviously I'm wrong. So maybe pray for yourself and pray for your, your, your own heart and be like, God, help me out here. I know I'm wrong. I don't see where I'm wrong, but I've got this weird thing going on where I'm upset with you and I know that's not right. Can you be so gracious as to help me with my own issues towards you right now? And um, that would be one, one thing you might consider. Um, number nine, I'll take a few more. Uh, Michelle Joubert, uh, Joubert, I'm just assuming that's French. I have no idea. I'm probably butchering your name. I'm sorry. Um, how do you deal with old malice towards someone who has passed away? Um, just pray about it every time you feel it. That'd be my counsel. I'm not, and I'm not saying it'll fix it. I don't know um, if Christian answers are always quick fixes. Sometimes they're just in the direction of something good, you know? So if you have old malice, and every time that pops up in your head, at that moment, move in the direction of something good. For me, this is prayer. Prayer is the biggest thing that changes my heart. Um, God, help me with this. Help me with this. Help me with this. Um, and yeah, just seek him in it. Learn how to pray for your specific scenario there. Um, our Wholesome Home has a question. Um, how do you handle a husband who struggles with anger while respecting the, the role as wife? Where's the line? Man, this is a question that would be better um, better answered by my wife. <laughs> so um, uh, how do you handle the husband and you're trying to, to deal with your role as the wife? Well, being respectful to him doesn't mean you're, doesn't even mean you're agreeing with him, doesn't mean you're, you're cowing to everything he says. Um, uh, nor does it mean you're, you're being disrespectful and rude or something like that. So gosh, what, what would be advice for you? I almost feel like it would be, uh, rude for me to give you some off the cuff advice that might not really apply to your situation, but, but always set the Lord at the front of your mind so that at the, at the end of it, you know, I honored God. And what will often happen with an angry person is they'll blame you for their anger. Um, but, but have, have the internal awareness to realize when the anger is, is on them and it's really not about you. And that, that's hard to do, especially if it's a husband who is angry and is blaming you, right? This is your fault. You make me so mad, that kind of thing. Um, no, if you were honoring Christ, if you, in your behavior that day and the things that you, you were honoring the Lord, I did no sin, that is not on you. And you need to sort of know that and be aware of that so that in the end of like sort of a difficult moment the two of you have, that you could walk away, go to your prayer closet, so to speak, and be like, God, did I do anything wrong? And, and, and be able to know, like, I'm clear here, God, this is his issue. You know, the two are one, right? But that doesn't mean that all of his issues are your issues. I hope that something I said there is of benefit to you. I'm sure there's a lot more that could be said. Um, Lori Wolfcat says, Hey, Mike, uh, who's your biggest inspiration? Like, uh, Nick Vujicic and Tony Robbins are my biggest inspirations. Oh, um, um, good question. I don't know. Who's my biggest inspiration? The guys I look up to the most aren't ministry leaders. Um, they're just guys that are solid husbands, good fathers, godly men. They're my biggest inspirations. It's not great speakers. It's not people with amazing stories. It's just people who there's a guy that honors Christ with his life and lives out his convictions. Um, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Like my father-in-law, my, my wife's uh, dad, definitely. He's on that list. Yeah. Those, those are the people that inspire me the most. Um, number 12, Josie J says, what are indications of true forgiveness? Oh, hmm. That's an interesting question. How do I know that I'm forgiving? Um, I guess you no longer have that sensation that you that you feel like you need them to be punished, that you want them to suffer or to pay in some sense. When you when you no longer feel that, perhaps perhaps that's an indication. Um, you're 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 able to look at them as they truly are, rather than seeing them through the malice. Um, that's another indication. Um, you're ready to restore the relationship if it's appropriate. If they've you know had a change of character, a change in those areas, you're actually able to restore the relationship. You're ready for that. Those those might be indications of true forgiveness. Um, and perhaps you're on a path. Perhaps it's a it's a journey towards that, and it's not just a black and white issue of on and off. Uh, number thirteen, I think. Well, the final question for tonight. Katie Simpson says, uh, looking at Second John one verses nine through eleven. If your family member was a pastor, 
teaching things that stray from the truth of the Bible after presenting truth to them for a while, would you disconnect? Ooh, tough question. Okay. Um, second John, uh, one, nine, let's, I'll bring it up, bring it up for, for you guys as well. It says, everyone who goes ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the father and the son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting for what whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. This is a complicated issue and probably not something I'll be able to fully unpack in our brief stream. And um, look at that. My, my border was off. Like, what was up with that? Okay. I'm less, I feel less professional than I already wasn't. Um, okay. Here's the idea. Um, when it comes to ministry stuff, right? If someone's if first, second John here, if this is applying, then this person is not teaching Christ. Like they're not just off on a minor issue. They're off on the essentials of the faith. And I will absolutely break, um, I will break ministry with them. I won't be able to fellowship with that person. Doesn't mean I can't outreach to them in some sense, but I can't fellowship with them as a, as though they were a Christian, like to, to, to approve of them and what they're doing, that sort of thing. Um, so that's easy. The tough thing is when it's your family. Because, let me give, me, give you an example. Um, I think it's in, uh, is it First Peter? He talks about a, a woman who has, she's a believer, but her husband's a non-believer. And she's counseled to stay with the guy, even though he's a non-believer. Yet, he might be this guy. He might be this, this false, rejecting Christ, preaching a false Jesus. He might be that non-believer. Yet, she's still supposed to stay with her husband if they can make it work. And, um, and that means that, Sometimes your connection as a family and your connection as a church family are not the same thing. So whereas you might be, you might have to separate in a spiritual church sense, there may not be that separation in a family sense. So sometimes it gets complicated and I, uh, I couldn't pretend to know how to apply that to every situation, but I'm just reading your question again to see if I've answered it. Um, uh, Katie, uh, if your family member was a pastor teaching things that stray from the truth of the Bible after presenting truth to them for a while, would you disconnect? I would disconnect from his church if it was this kind of, error, you know, I would definitely disconnect from his church. I would disconnect from his teaching. I would even openly speak against the things that he was teaching, but I would strive to have a, a good relationship with him as a family member. Um, and would that be hard? Yeah, <laughs> that'd be tough, but that's my understanding of it. Perhaps there's greater wisdom for people who, uh, have actually been through that, um, and have learned some lessons. So thank you guys for joining me. AJ, thanks for your help, buddy. In the uh, comments, I really appreciate it. I, um, Look forward to uh, hopefully seeing you guys sometime next week if I'm able to do a live stream. If not, I'll be back the following week on Tuesday. So, Lord bless you. 